Welcome back to McGrathmatics. Today I'm going to take you through some permutations and combinations HSC questions for the Extension 1 Maths HSC course, taking through the variety of the entire topic. Let's we'll start off with this first one from the 2024 HSC. We have students from four schools come together to form a choir. That's nice. Uh, what is the minimum size of the choir? So there must be at least 20 students in the choir from one of the schools. All right, this is a question where we're going to be applying the pigeonhole principle. So in this example, our pigeons are going to be our four schools. And the way I like to approach these is I'm trying to get 20 students from one of the four categories, which is one of the four schools. And I'm just going to pretend that I'm getting really unlucky. So maybe if I got super unlucky, I ended up with 19 people from each of the four schools and I'm trying to get 20. Which means now that I have four times 19 picked, which is 76 students. Now when I pick the next one, which brings us up to 77, the 77th student has to go into one of these four categories and put us over to 20 which tells me that the answer for this one is 77. If I have 77 people divided amongst four, category, four categories, there will be at least 20 students in one of the four categories. Okay, up next from a bit of an older question from the 2007 HSC, which is probably about as old as you are if you're watching this. We have Mr. and Mrs. Roberts and their four children go to a theatre. They are randomly allocated six adjacent seats in a single row. What is the probability that the four children are allocated seats next to each other? Okay, so let's think, if we have six people arranged randomly in a line, how many different ways can we do that? Well, we know that that is gonna be six factorial, right? That is our known different possible arrangements of six objects in a row. However, what we want is our arrangements to look something like this. We want the green dots to represent the kids and we want these all grouped together. The blue dots, which are the parents, can go on either side and move around, but we wanna try and keep these four green dots together. So how do we achieve this? Well, we're just gonna group these together and consider these to be one object. Okay, I know I shouldn't be referring to children's objects, but let's just move past it. So now that I've grouped these four together, we now have one, two, three objects to move around. And the total number of ways that we can arrange three objects is three factorial. But the extra trick here is that one of our three objects has four items, which means we could arrange the kids um, in this item in four factorial ways. Okay, so these four, inside of this group can be arranged in four factorial ways. That means their total arrangements is going to be three factorial times, factor times four factorial if we wanted to look something like this. So to answer the question now, which is to find the probability that it looks like this, well, that's going to be three factorial times four factorial out of a total possible arrangements of six factorial. And that actually works out to be a nice, neat one out of five for two marks. Okay, that's our arrangements. Let's do this next one. Another multiple choice from the 2017 HSC. Bit of a tougher one now. We have uh, three squares are chosen at random from the three by three grid below and a cross is placed in each of the chosen squares. So it could look something like this. One, two, three. We once again want the probability. Um, this time it's the probability that our three crosses lie in the same row, column or diagonal like I just showed you. Okay, so. Um, the way I just put those crosses into this diagram, I have a row, or I have a diagonal, sorry. But the thing is, I could have done this in a different way. I could have put the cross in the middle first, and then done this cross down here, and this cross up here, and I would still end up with the same outcome of this diagonal being filled. Why I'm talking about this is because I'm trying to emphasize that the order in which I place these three cro crosses doesn't matter. As long as they're in these three spots, I end up with the same outcome. So when we are making a selection from a total number of possible options and the order in which I make those selections is not important, this is the definition of a combination. So if I was just picking three at random, that would be me choosing three options out of nine options and the order isn't important. So that tells me this is a combination of three from nine options. Okay, so choosing three squares is a combination of three from nine, which is nine C three, which we can calculate to be 84. So in total, there's 84 possible ways I could place three, square, three crosses in this three by three grid. Now out of these 84 options, how many of them are gonna be the same row, column, or diagonal? Well, I've got one here for my diagonal. I could go across the other diagonal for two, and then I've got my three rows across and my three columns down. So I've got three plus three plus two, which is eight. So it seems like the probability of getting a scenario like this is going to be eight out of 84. And eight out of 84 simplifies to two out of 21. And that's why B is gonna be our selection for this question. Okay, up next, we're gonna take a look at a binomial expansion question. This one comes to us from the 2011 HSC, which fun fact is the HSC paper that I did back in the day, which gives you a pretty good idea of exactly 
how ancient I am. But anyway, we want to find an expression for the coefficient of x squared in the expansion of 3x minus 4 over x, all to the power of 8. Okay, let's start off by setting up our binomial expansion and try and see if we can spot a pattern to figure out where we're going to find our x squared term. So starting off with our first term, we're going to do a combination of 0 from 8, and then we have the first term to the power of 8, and the second term, including the negative, is going to get the power of 0. Now, if I um, simplify this and expand it all out, what I'm going to end up with is, is an x to the power of 8, which I don't want. I want an x squared. Let's take a look at the next term. For the next term, we keep the structure the exact same, except now we have 8c1. We reduce the 8 to a power of 7, and we increase this to a power of 1, so these two numbers always match. Okay, simplifying this will eventually give me x to the 7 divided by x to the 1, which will give me x to the 6, which I do not want. So where in my structure am I going to find a term where the difference between this power of x and this power of x will be a difference of 2? Well, the next one's going to be 6 and 2, which gives me 4. The one after that, it's going to be 5 and 3, which when I do x to the 5 divided by x to the 3, that's going to give me an x squared, and that tells me where to look, which I could have got if I just kept going, but I'm just trying to sort of skip ahead and be efficient here. So skipping a term and going to 8c3, which is the fourth term, that's going to be a 3x to the power of 5 and a minus 4 over x to the power of 3. And this is good because these two powers are going to give me an x squared. So let's just simplify this term and see what it works out to be. We have 8c3, which is 56. Um, we have 3 to the power of 5, which is 243. And then for my second term, I've got 4 cubed, which is 64. Negative is still negative, and x cubed is x cubed. Okay, cool. So just uh, calculating all this by doing 56 times 243 times 64, that's going to get me 870912. I've got an x to the power of 5 on the top of the fraction and an x cubed on the bottom, and I'm just putting the negative out the front. Okay, simplifying my x terms is going to give me an x squared, which then tells me that my coefficient of x squared in this expansion is negative. 870,912 for two marks. So not too bad. So definitely, definitely, definitely know how to set up the structure of a binomial expansion because it's assessed pretty much every year these days. Okay, moving on to our next one. We have a circular arrangement question from the 2023 HSC. This was a very tough question that a lot of people really struggled with putting it into the top possible band of E4. Okay, we have five students and three teachers to be arranged in a circle. In how many ways can this be done if no more than two students sit together? All right, let's set up our circular table. What we're going to do first is we're going to sit our teachers. I'm going to put one here, one here, and one here. Now, if we want to place a certain number of objects in a row, it would be n factorial. If we're placing them in a circle, it's one minus factorial. So the total number of ways that I can put three teachers seated in a circle is going to be three minus one factorial, which is two factorial. Okay, so now in these spots, I'm going to be fitting my five students. And the trick here is that now because the teachers are already sitting, by putting these five students in here, they are no longer in a circle because the circle has been broken by the teachers. So putting the five students in these spots is just going to be five factorial, not four factorial. Okay, so, um, so five students in the remaining spots in five factorial ways looks like this. Now the extra trick to this question is that because we are splitting up the students like this, and because there's five of them, we have to have two groups of two and a group of one because we can't have more than two students sitting together. So how does that change our calculation? Well, it means that we have three distinct options for where the loner student sitting by themselves can be. It could look like this, or we could have the single student here, or we could have the single student down here. Because this is three extra options, we now need to multiply by three because we have three options for the single student to sit by themselves. So putting that all together, we have four factorial for the teachers, then we have five factorial for the students, and then multiplying by three for the single student gives us this. And which of our four options does this look like? Well, I can take the two factorial and multiply it by three, and that's gonna make it into a three factorial, and that's why B is gonna be our correct answer for this band six multiple choice question. Okay, and to finish off this video, we have a probability question coming to us from the 2014 HSC exam. This was actually the hardest question in the 2014 Extension 1 Maths exam. So let's see if we can try and wrap our heads around it. We have two players playing a game and they are spinning a spinner with sections P, R and Q and the probability of landing in P, R and Q are P, R and Q. All right, now here are the rules. If I spin it and it lands in section P, I win, wahoo. If I land in Q, that means I lose and you win, congratulations. 
Or if I landed in R, I haven't won or lost, it's just passing to you and now it's your turn to spin. Okay, so we've got probability of winning, probability of losing, and probability of passing. Now the actual question, it's a two-parter, and here's the first part. Um, player A is gonna go first, and we wanna show that the probability of them winning on the first or second turn of the game is one minus R, P plus R. Okay, so I'm gonna go first, and let's see how many different ways I can win on the first or second turn. Either I can just land on P straight away, and then I've won, sucked in, you lose. Or I could land on R, which then passes it to you, and then you fumble it by spinning it onto Q. You lose, I win, sucked in. So that's what we're gonna try and set up for our calculation. We're gonna say player A or player me can win by either winning on the first turn, or I can pass it to you, and then you land on the losing sector. All right, so combining this into a probability, we just have P and then RQ, and we could have either of these happening. So we're going to add them together and say the probability of winning on the first or second turn is P plus RQ. Now the issue here is that it doesn't look like what the question told me to get. The question told me to get one minus R, P plus R. So how are we gonna get that? Well, my expression here has a Q in it, and the problem does not have the Q in it. So how am I gonna get rid of my Q? All right, what we're gonna figure out here is the Q is losing, and that's essentially P and R not happening, or AKA, the complement of P and R. So we can say that the probability of Q is equal to 100%, or one, take away R and P happening, okay? Because Q is R and P not, basically. So we're gonna take this red fact here, and we're gonna put it into our green expression here to make that Q into a one minus R plus P. We're gonna do a bit of expanding now by multiplying everything inside here by r. So we get r, we get minus r squared, and we get minus rp. And then the last bit of this question, which I'm leaving up to you because I've run out of room and I can't be bothered, is can you factorize this expression right here and make it look like the target in the question for two marks? Let me know how you go in the comments. On to the last part of the question. We have player A taking the first turn. This one's worth three marks and it is much more challenging. Show that the probability that player A wins eventually is given by P plus R divided by one plus R. Okay, so if I'm player A and I wanna win eventually, it's gonna be a similar scenario to the first question where either I'm going to win or I'm going to pass it to you and then you fumble it. Or if I'm passing to you, you could then pass it back to me and then we could just repeat that scenario again. So setting up the possibilities of me winning the game, either it's gonna be me winning on the first or second goes, which we already calculated in part I, or it could be me passing it to you and then you passing it back and then basically part I happening again, okay? So either two passes, so passing to you, passing back to me and then repeating the same scenario from part I. So let's try and turn this into some form of equation. We have here is me winning um, turn one or two already calculated. Here is that happening again after two passes, R times R. Or technically it could pass four times. I could go pass to you, pass back, pass back, pass back. We could be doing this multiplied by r squared once again. And this could go on and on and on and on forever. And that's why we have an infinite series right here. So let's make some room and figure out what we're working with here. Because we're starting with one minus r p plus r, and each time we are multiplying by the same thing, which is r squared, this is the definition of a geometric series. We have our first term in the geometric series shown right here, and we have our multiplier between each terms being r squared. Now the cool thing about this is because we're multiplying by r squared, which is a probability, which means that r squared is going to be less than one, when you're multiplying by something that's making the series shorter or smaller, I should say, between each term, that means you'll be able to calculate what's called the infinite sum of the series. And hopefully you learned about this in the advanced course. This formula is on your reference sheet if you need to lose, uh, use it, sorry. And so we're gonna use it. We're gonna put in our first term, which is one minus r p plus r. And on the bottom, we're gonna do one minus r squared, and that's gonna calculate the sum of these things all adding up, which is us winning eventually for the first player. So on the top, one minus r p plus r. On the bottom, one minus r squared. Um, we're trying to get this thing here with just a one plus r on the bottom. So what we're gonna do is we're going to factorize the bottom using a difference of squares. And now it's super easy, because we have a one minus r on top and bottom of the fraction, so we can cancel those away, and that leaves us with p plus r on the top, check, and one plus R on the bottom, check, and there is your three marks. Okay, if you made it to the end, thank you so much for watching, and I hope that helped you get a bit more confident with perms and comms for your HSC. If you're struggling with a question and need some help, feel free to reach out on Instagram, and I'll do my best to assist you. And if you wanna see some shorter versions of these videos, um, I just started up a TikTok the other day, and I'm trying to put up a revision question every day in the lead up to the HSC. So follow along if you want some more maths in your feed. All right. That's all for today. Good luck for your HSC and thanks for watching. I'll see you later. Bye for now, not forever.